You're listening to The Streaming Wars, the podcast that discusses all of the latest happenings regarding your favorite streaming services. Find out which service is winning the war this time around. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of The Streaming Wars. I'm Dustin, and Tony is with me, and we are here to cover everything from August 12th through the 18th. We have some news. We have a short discussion point that you will probably not expect from anywhere out there. But let's get into the news first. So starting off with Netflix, there is a romantic comedy film from Alicia Keys that is currently in development. Fear Street Trilogy, which was originally at Disney, is now heading over to Netflix and is rumored that all three films release one after another for each month during the summer of 2021. There is a documentary focusing on the London nail bombings that has been ordered at Netflix. Sarah Cooper, who is the comedian who has a TikTok that... Uh, lip syncs Donald Trump. She has landed a Netflix comedy special. Netflix has acquired the film rights to The Upper World. And then there is a Princess Diana musical, which will debut on Netflix prior to it actually debuting on Broadway, specifically before Broadway even reopens. Yeah, that's pretty surprising because then that never happens. Usually Broadway wants to protect its opening, you know, theaters, um, its opening shows and try to milk as much money as possible. And it just this is this is just kind of an unprecedented deal that's going to be released on just anywhere, but then on the streaming service before it is released on Broadway. So that's going to be interesting for just if you're a theater nut and you love Broadway, just to just the economics of that situation alone. Um, if you're very interested in that, that's, that's it's just just a monumental in, its, in and of itself. But I think it also shows that there is an appetite on the streaming side of things. There's an appetite for Broadway specials. And I think Disney Plus proved that out with Hamilton that Broadway can be successful. It can be something that is streamable, that is bingeable, that you can watch at home, but still feel like you're part of the theater. And it's nice to see that Netflix has kind of understood that and they're launching a Princess Diana musical. So that's going to be interesting. It's also be interesting on the premise of like her life, of her life being made a musical. But I, I mean, I hope I hope it's good. It's it's very, it's very interesting and bold. And I appreciate Netflix for doing something like that. All right, jumping over to Prime Video, there is an eight movie anthology series called Welcome to Blumhouse, which is coming to Prime Video this October. This is going to include Include eight new films from Blumhouse Productions. Jumping over to Hulu, Mexican Gothic, which is a drama series, is in the works at Hulu. And then Lionsgate has switched the movie Run from a theatrical release to streaming via Hulu. There's there's a line um, about halfway through the article, and it, basically the the author is the writer is talking about how even though that even though that the movie theaters are opening back up, and just the, so that everyone knows, I think starting this weekend. Um, as of we were recording this, um, AMC is like reopening it back up some of their theaters for like 15 cents like runs of different shows like the empire strikes back is one of those things that's kind of a big hit to draw people back out but um even still in, in america there's there's still you know the covid crisis that's happening and so um, a lot of these theaters are going to have basically you know next to very limited cap- capacity for these projects so even though yes movie theaters are starting to open back up in america there's not going to be much seating just available and then because of that shortage there's going to be you know high demand on that so it's going to be hard to get people in and hard to make any money off of those movies and the, the Ryder basically kind of calls this out and it's like, yeah, even though AMC and Regal are opening, there is even more skepticism and, and more and just more restrained by these different distributors to forgo low to mid budget movies. And and basically with the limited capacity that we have, we want to leverage our, our theaters to carry big budget movies or, or movies that have a big name. And Empire Strikes Back is, is just one of those classics that would get people to the theater. I mean, you probably have Black Widow, which is going to do the same thing. And you're going to see different, see even more just movies go to streaming because, you know, these distributors are not offering them a seat at the table for their movies to be viewed. But then also, even if they were to go there and it's lower budget, there there's no guarantee that it's going to even make just any decent percentage of like the normal profit. And at least, you know, streaming players, especially Apple TV, would pay pretty pretty good money. And that's that's guaranteed money and it's not contingent on things. So it's interesting to see that other people are calling this out and, and seeing that this trend is happening with low to mid budget movies. And with other people calling this out, I'm curious how the industry is going to react to it. And just not just like a you know the industry players and whatnot, but I think overall there's gonna be even more of a push that only big blockbusters will go onto the movie theater screens and then um, anything else is gonna be just purely for, for streaming. Like we've seen the trend for a while, but I think COVID nineteen 
2019 has definitely accelerated that. And it's shown some big, um, I wouldn't say issues with, you know, like the movie business and how theaters play a part of that. But I think that the, the economics of it all is definitely going to change. And it, it's it's going to be it's going to be interesting. But I, I was just glad to, to just to hear a little bit more validation from other people in the space of, of how they see things similar to how we see them. So. All right. So nothing for CBS All Access, Apple TV Plus. Martin Scorsese has signed a first look deal with Apple, which we discussed last episode. That is for TV and film projects, specifically as a producer. Obviously, he doesn't work on TV projects, but he does have a production company that will be working with Apple TV Plus. Apple has also picked up the animated Harry the Spy series, and that is coming in the near future. We'll add to Apple's offering, the Apple's children's offering of content that they have. Jumping over to Disney Plus, Verizon has extended their Disney Plus offer with uh, the addition of Hulu and ESPN Plus. So basically, you will now be able to, with certain unlimited plans that Verizon offers, you will now be able to get the Disney Hulu ESPN Plus bundle that uh, is typically $13 a month. You can now get all of those services services as part of certain unlimited packages that Verizon is offering. Then in addition to that, Disney Plus has announced that they have a Lego Star Wars holiday special that is coming to the service this November. That is, I think a lot of fans who uh, who remember the original holiday special would probably appreciate the fact that they are going to be dealing with some of the same elements that that one did, but obviously in Lego form. This one is actually supposed to be taking place after The Rise of Skywalker, so it's almost as if it is a sequel to the current the, the movies that just wrapped up. Oh, don't say sequel like that. Um, man, it just reading the premise of of the of the plot. Just man, it makes me uh, it makes me question this this move. Um, I'm not necessarily I'm not a fan of it. Um, I think the holiday special is very unique in its own way, and it's it's infamous as just being like woefully awful. But you know, it's still got like a, an endearing place in people's hearts. But when I first when I first saw this, I was excited as a just a big Star Wars fan and just to just to goof for a second. Just really really was like, oh cool, we're gonna do some of the holiday special, blah blah blah. But yeah, this does not seem interesting, um, especially as a sequel to the Rise of the Skywalker. Just let let the story end. You don't need to continue it. Just let it let it be. This actually kind of reminds me of my my kid really is love. Uh, frozen and there's like a frozen legos special and there's this they do some of the holidays and trying to find the northern lights and i thought it would be kind of something like that where it's like pretty much like it's the same characters but it doesn't tie into basically anything at all and kids can enjoy it but this unfortunately feels like it's gonna continue a little bit of the story afterwards and i don't know just as a star wars fan i just don't need to know what happens after nine just let it let it end let it end peacefully so there you go or as your daughter might say let it go let it go oh that was that was that was smooth and and people we did not rehearse that that was, yes. that was pretty good yeah all right, so nothing for Quibi. Uh, HBO Max. HBO Max has landed a deal with Comedy Central for three different shows. The shows, specifically, Aquafina is Nora from Queens. That is going to be a streaming video on demand rights package, while the other shows, the other two, and Southside will actually move from Comedy Central over to HBO Max for their second seasons. Then at and CFO has stated that the HBO Max launch is not the reason for the recent restructuring, but specifically in a negative manner. The point of the article is not, or the point of his comments is not to say that HBO Max isn't the reason because we know it is the reason because HBO Max is the reason people are being let go and they are laying out, they're being laid off and that they're restructuring Warner Media. But it's not because HBO Max didn't do well and that's why they're getting rid of people. It's because, in, if anything, it's actually done well enough to show the company that HBO Max needs to be the highest priority that they have. And that is why things are being restructured right now. So it's not necessarily about the fact that it's not related to HBO Max because it is. But he just wanted to make sure that he painted it in a way where, hey, HBO Max is not – it's not that it's not doing well because it is doing well. But we we want to make this a priority, and that means making this the highest priority, and that means other things that aren't as important. We're going to restructure that stuff to make it make more sense for the future of the company, and specifically the priority of HBO Max for the company. I, I don't like the the author's conclusion to this restructuring that's happened. Like, of, of course, that there has been wide restructuring across all of pretty much AT and T, especially the Warner Media division, just just 
going down in many different areas and more of a consolidation on HBO Max and streaming and, you know, pruning off the side ventures and projects and, and focusing the company pretty much on the goal of like what, what the future is and it is streaming. That's just what it is. So uh, I, don't, I don't see the cause and effect relationship that the author um, concluded that, okay, because HBO Max. Mo- HBO Max launched and there's a potential failure there. Then they restructured everything because it wasn't working. And it's like, no, no, no. Like, you know, Killark comes in. They already had plans to do the launch. So they go through with the launch and then he does what every executive does when they come to a new company, basically sort of cleans house and starts his own vision. And, you know, right or wrong, that's just what usually happens. And so it, it, you know, Killar's, Killar's been in the game for a while. I mean, he, he, he made Hulu into kind of what it is today. He started his own other streaming service and that was successful for a while. Like he knows what he's doing. And so coming in into at t and seeing all of what, what lies underneath the Warner media, just, just huge label of different things that's happening. Like, of course he's going to come in and, and restreamline things. And he knows what the future of the business is. You know, at t knows what their future is going to be. And it's not cable. It's not all those, all, all stuff like that. It is, it is streaming. So, I feel like the the correlation that was there just doesn't the the causation that was derived from the article just doesn't make sense because like the HBO Max like did it have hiccups yes like is it the best service ever like no like it still's got a way to go but it's definitely not a failure in terms of a launch I mean and we, we don't joke about it like people don't joke about it as as they do Quibi is a pretty successful service in its own right like it's got some hiccups but it's still going um it's still doing pretty pretty okay so and just I feel like this was just an article that wanted to to prove a point. And I feel like it, the, the point is flawed. He was going to do changes already. Like it just even in our even in our analysis of each of, of Warner Media before HBO Max, you know, kind of developed and became a thing. It was just like as they mentioned that hey, they're going to launch their own streaming service. Like they had so many different projects and properties in different areas and different other streaming channels that were already operating at the same time. Like they had to do some consolidation. There was going to be restructurings. There was going to be like a rebranding of of different things. So it just I just disagree fundamentally with like the main conclusions of the article it, it just it was going to happen this way and doesn't mean that anything's wrong just means that killer sees a certain vision for the company and he is moving warner media into that direction yeah i agree it's definitely one of those things where you could look at it two different ways the negative way obviously is going to be well hbo max isn't doing well and that's what's happening but that's not the case at all i think they're in their mind hbo max is doing exactly what they wanted to do if not better than you know when they per, when they made their projections last year they were hoping for a specific number they are at that specific number however they're looking at the numbers so it's definitely not related to that so to paint the situation that's currently happening as well it's not doing as well that would be a really weird thing to let a bunch of people go specifically because the main priority of the company isn't performing as well as they'd hope but i agree it's it's a it's a weird thing and killar is making decisions that make sense for the company as sucky as it is for a lot of people losing their jobs it is what needs to happen to make a leaner meaner machine that can that can produce good stuff going forward for warner media and more specifically for hbo max so the other part of uh killer talking of he, he's been making the rounds making a bunch of doing a bunch of interviews and things like that and i believe we t- brought this up on the last episode but the article specifically mentioned here, Kilar has actually, during one of his interviews, there was there was talk about whether or not Amazon and Roku, there was going to be deals in place. Specifically, it was posed to him like, hey, is there any deal with Amazon? And this is bringing back up that Bezos comment from the uh, Senate hearings that we talked about uh, on a past episode. And he specifically said, it's in Amazon's best interest to make a deal with HBO Max because as the holiday season comes along, there is going to be people who are looking for devices and they're going to be looking for devices that stream all of the 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 offerings out there not just some of them and right now with roku and amazon now while he was only talking about amazon obviously roku falls in the same lines without those two having these other services then it becomes a bigger deal obviously this is a big deal for peacock too because it's the exact same situation as hbo max they want deals in place with these things, but they're not willing to like move around and bend to the will of Amazon or Roku to, you know, obviously to a certain degree, just like Amazon and Roku, they don't want to bend to HBO Max or in the, in the case of Peacock either. So the thing is, it makes perfect sense 
because as the holiday season comes comes up, it, this is going to be a much bigger deal for these these uh, devices. You know, there's certain devices that you can watch basically everything on, and then there's certain devices that you can't like. And personally, I don't like this because I don't have one. But Apple TV is one of the devices that you can watch literally anything on. There's no restrictions in place with any of the the, the big streaming services that are out there. Amazon, while Google obviously has no restrictions, the one that they don't have obviously is Apple. They don't have Apple TV Plus available on their service because of the you know just Google versus Apple situation. But the thing is, in in my mind, Apple is the one that could potentially move forward because there is no restrictions. The only thing, that, of course, that's holding them back is the the price point for the normal consumers. So. We'll see what happens with that. I understand Kalara's reasoning in the, in the sense of fact of like it makes sense for Amazon that as the time as you know the holidays come around, HBO Max is going to be a draw for some some amount of people, mainly the people that are like friends. No, I'm just messing around. Like they got good content, and that's going to be a draw for a lot of people. And yeah, they might move to a different competitor, but unfortunately, there's no one in the space that is is like you have like HBO Max has issues with Amazon and Roku, so. Um, you know, both of them contribute more than half of a hall of streaming devices that that connect with TVs. Um, it's just like they, they they dominate that space, and even Roku has like a two to one or three to one edge over Amazon. So, I mean, his reasoning makes sense in a vacuum, but when you when you put it into other things of like he doesn't have a deal with Roku yet, like Kalar doesn't have a deal with Roku, um, and getting HBO Max on Roku devices, like just I feel like. This, this argument lacks any muster because of that. At this point, it just seems like Amazon and Roku are basically just waiting to see who's going to sign the first deal. And then basically their deals are going to base off of what the other person signs. I just wish that this was going to be resolved sometime soon. As a as a fan of streaming, as a fan of the service, as a fan of all this, I would like to watch HBO Max on my uh, Roku TV. Just pure personally. So it's, it's just frustrating to see this. And hopefully they'll come to some type of conclusion sometime soon i think that at the end of the day that as the holiday season does come around that a rising tide is going to lift all boats so just making deals with these these people is going to be better overall for the long term for all the companies involved but there is going to be significant negotiating that's going to have to happen for each side to feel like it's gotten what it wants so hopefully this will be resolved sometime soon but we are fortunately not not there yet all right so Moving on, we have Peacock. MacGruber series is moving forward to Peacock. That was a series that was originally rumored back when Peacock was being announced, but that actually is moving forward with Will Forte reprising his role. There are two new comedy talk shows that are headed to Peacock, one with Larry Wilmore and one with Amber Ruffin. The Dan Patrick Show is a sports show that is heading to the free tier on Peacock that will be available there. There's a young adult mystery drama called one of us is lying that is also heading to peacock and then the clueless reboot has also landed at peacock as well jumping over to niche streaming services we have curiosity stream is looking to go public after landing 13 million subscribers dustin what is curiosity stream because i feel like they've been a no name in the space and all of a sudden they just announced that hey they're going public and they have 13 million subscribers yeah so curiosity stream is a streaming service that's out there that specifically focuses on documentaries tv shows and short form video that has to do with like educational stuff it was launched in 2015 it's pretty successful because it i I mean to be fair i had no idea that it has it had as many subscribers as it did this news article by itself i was like wow 13 million but there's a lot of educational type content that is there they also have content for bbc as well that that is you know that is licensed specifically for it but basically it's educational stuff that's the idea of a lot of the content that's there it's surprising that it has as many subscribers as it does but the fact that a streaming service that essentially is off on its own is looking to go public is is very interesting because that's not something we hear about every day yeah i mean i was i was surprised about the service and you know go them go curious stream you know hopefully your ipo goes well you earn a lot of money and um you keep growing the service but yeah i was just like you know you, you i saw this in the, in the show notes and just did some digging i was like man how have we never heard of them before all right so then the other remaining niche streaming service stuff is all related to warner media in some way shape or form so the first one is there is a there's supposedly a cnn direct to consumer service that may be in the works now i'm specifically talking about this first because we're going to talk about two other services here 
in a second that kind of contradict this idea of a new service. I think part of this, the reason this popped up right now is because it was just announced that Fox, specifically not the 20th Century Fox, but the the, the division of Fox that has sports and news, they launched. They just launched their own streaming service, specifically focusing on news. And I think the immediate numbers were, you know, fairly successful enough to maybe make some other people look in and say, "Hey, we have a news division. Maybe we should do something like this too." The other reason I think that this exists is, or the other reason this could exist is because, as we've talked about in the past, when it comes to content, there's only two types of content that people consume on a live basis: news and sports. And and because people will watch news and sports live, there is a desire to have that. And when you look at the big news divisions out there, Fox, and MSNBC, CNN, you look at these larger news divisions and the amount of content that they have, they produce a lot of content themselves just for their individual channels that they have. However, the, the interesting thing is when you take them away from the live packages, We're seeing sports do their own thing. You know, as time progresses, we're seeing sports kind of morph into certain types of sports are, you know, specifically we've seen UFC make a a, uh, deal with ESPN Plus where ESPN Plus is carrying the pay-per-views for UFC. So if you want to watch a UFC fight, you actually have to subscribe to ESPN Plus and then pay for the pay-per-view as well just to watch certain amounts of content. The normal stuff that's not part of the pay-per-view will be on ESPN Plus, but it shows that sports are you know, evolving with the type of content and delivery service that they have. WWE, which is wrestling, already has their own service. We have seen there's obviously MLB has their own service. There's a lot of services out there that are slowly you know, evolving into something else. NFL has their licensing deals because obviously that's much more beneficial for them. But I honestly see sports as, you know, going the way of the exact same thing as all the other streaming services where depending on the type of sport, you'll have a specific type of service. News can be exactly that too. And it saves people the cost of having to go get one of these live TV options from Hulu or YouTube TV or FUBU TV or wherever else you're looking at these services that are all, in, you know, all priced right now currently between 50 to 100 dollars depending on which service you have and there's only a couple of reasons we've all heard the reasons why people subscribe to live television is for news and sports so if sports does its own thing and doesn't cost 70 dollars a month news could certainly do the exact same thing and then there's obviously more direct money that can come into those news divisions and the their parent companies from something like that so while it is counterproductive to what we're about to talk about with some of the other Warner Warner streaming services that are out there. It does make sense that this could be the route to go, specifically because it is one of those two things that people are looking for when they're looking for live television coverage. Um, I have mixed feelings about this idea of splitting CNN and all the news coverage away from HBO Max. Now, I think it would be a compelling offering to include all of CNN within HBO Max. I feel like that'd be very compelling. As someone who likes to keep up with politics, and especially you know this year, there were a whole bunch of Democratic debates. Like I had to go find um, the past two years. There's I had to go find the correct set of. I had to get I think Hulu TV because Hulu TV had all the necessary channels, live channels that held all the Democratic debates because they were on a bunch of different services. With CNN being one of them, you know CNN is not on normal in America. It's not on over over the air. Like it, it's not going to be one of those those few television stations like ABC, C- CBS, or NBC. So you have to like kind of go out of your way to find it. So from the news part of it, like I do, that would be nice just to have the news option with the streaming service. Uh, I would find that also very appealing. However, CNN's also branched out over the years. I feel like that they've tried to diversify their brand a little bit, just instead of just pure news. Also making documentaries of different types. There was a. It started with this show, and there's like a series of shows that documentaries on the different decades in America. And I first saw this on on Netflix a few years ago. It was called the 1960s. And it was a great, great um, documentary covering the whole entire time is uh, each season. It was one, it was about like one season and it had about 10 episodes and it talked about like the different big things that happened in the different decades, like sixties, the, the 1960s, there was a show like the 1970s, eighties, you know, two thousands, like that was fantastic content. And I can see more content like that coming out. It would be very interesting. And um, we see the New York times 
really get into podcasts recently and, you know, watching the weekly show or the monthly show on Hulu, watching some show on, on Hulu sometime soon. They've been dealing a lot more with different properties. So you're seeing news organizations moving that way. So I think streaming service would be a benefit for the other types of content, just besides the new, like the straight up, just, you know, normal news that happens. However, I think if anyone pays attention to America politics, it's a little bit interesting right now. And I'm interesting is, is not the right word. It's, it's just, it's a huge mess. And I can see from the execs at at t you know, with Killar, maybe it is to, to insulate HBO Max to just be about entertainment, to just, just to show content in movies and TV shows and be a distraction for people. Having that separation from CNN is, is a, is a pretty, it might be, might be beneficial from the business side. CNN for some people is, is great. CNN for some other people is just kind of like, okay, it's whatever. They're another news, news organization. But then there's some that like vehemently, like vehemently like hate um, CNN. So just to, just to bring, just to try to make HBO Max as apolitical as possible, I can see how making a separate streaming service for CNN would be the most logical choice. And yes, at the end of the day, they're all owned by the same parent company, but at least having like corporate, you know, these corporate walls that are kind of a little bit meaningless, but kind of true. I'm separating out, you know, HBO Max and the CNN service. It, It might be more beneficial at the end of the day. And if you just, you know, to, if you just look at American politics, like it's just, it's it's polarized now and it's going to get even more polarized as things go forward, unless something very, very much changes. So I can see to save like the business and to save themselves, like, let's just keep the news biz- news organization its own thing and let's not have it have all the side effects of having a news organization and publishing the news bleed into HBO Max's launch. So it's kind of like that catch 22 of like, I understand both scenarios and I think both sides are right and neither side's truly wrong. It just depends on like what what are, what's more important for ATT? Of like, do we want to keep HBO Max just like clean and, and separated from you know the potential benefits and side effects of, of CNN, or do we want to integrate it all? So it's kind of like a weird, weird situation. All right, so let's talk about the other one. So the other big news. Th- now this is completely not confirmed at this point, but Warner Media is looking to potentially sell Crunchyroll. Now we talked about Crunchyroll just last episode. They've got three million paid subscribers, seventy million active users on their their service worldwide that's huge numbers now the the more interesting thing is they're looking to sell it they're specifically putting a price tag of 1.5 billion dollars on Crunchyroll, and they're specifically seeking out sony because sony recently had a deal in place i believe with funmation which produces similar type of content that Crunchyroll does so they're looking to specifically sell it now the 1.5 billion dollars for Crunchyroll seems a little high i would probably put that number at probably half that at the very most because even if if they're bringing in 3 million subscribers and they've got, I think it's maybe, let's just say it was $10 a month. That's only $30 million every single month that they could potentially be bringing in if that's actually the case. So that's a, that's a huge multiple of, uh, you know, the, of what they're claiming it's worth. Now, the reason for this is specifically for a couple of reasons. Obviously, you could draw the connections and say, well, Warner Media is clearly clearing house and they're cleaning up things and, and making things a little bit more streamlined. Crunchyroll is a separate streaming service, very niche in, in the fact that it has content that obviously is appealing to people, but it's only a number of 3 million subscribers. And that's successful. I mean, that's a successful streaming service. But it's not the type of thing that they're looking for at this immediate point. However, the one thing that they do have is Crunchyroll does deliver content for HBO Max because there are certain content that is available through Crunchyroll that is available on HBO Max, which gives them that little bit of anime that every streaming service seems to want. Netflix has been putting a lot of focus into anime lately. In general, there's just a focus on making sure you have some sort of anime content on your service. So there is that. Now, that doesn't mean that they couldn't continue to license anime the same way Netflix does or other companies, but it does show that it's potentially something that they're looking at. However, the one thing that I have to say is everybody who's been talking about this has been saying, well, AT&T, of course, has $150 billion of debt. So whatever they can sell, they, you know, why wouldn't they try to sell it off? So that way they can make some money. And I have to say, yeah, but a lot of people have made that exact same argument and they've gone down the list of different businesses within Warner Media that they could sell. The biggest one, however, was Warner Brothers Interactive Entertainment, which produces a lot of video games. There's a lot of video game studios within that 
within that subsidiary of Warner Media that that's very successful. It produces a lot of games that make a lot of money. However, it seems weird that a division that's actually profitable that would be making money they would try to offload along with all of the licenses that come along with the studios that are producing this content. So I don't. I, that one was the one that I didn't. That one came up before even this restructuring business came up with a couple weeks ago. This was something that came up with over a month ago. But then there was also a rumor that they were looking to offload. DC Comics and license out the characters to other comic companies to create stories for. I could see something like that, but the other problem is that DC Films have the most potential as their largest franchise that they have within within the company. So I don't see them necessarily letting somebody else, unless they were going to get a ton of money licensing out that content elsewhere. Then the other one out there is that they're looking at potentially selling Crunchyroll. And I could see the Crunchyroll, like I said earlier, I could see the Crunchyroll just because it doesn't fit within their model. We've talked about this at length. We're going to talk about it a little bit more DC Universe seems like its days have been numbered since HBO Max was announced just because what's the point of having a service that allows that has original content that has content that could just be on HBO Max and give HBO Max more value by itself and the same thing is true with a lot of other Warner Warner proper Warner streaming services that they have there's Boomerang which has a lot of the Hanna-Barbera Tom and Jerry Looney Tunes content that is you know is not necessarily available all at the same time on HBO Max and Crunchyroll is the same way. So I think that Crunchyroll makes the most sense of all the services to actually be sold somewhere else because it doesn't have a direct and immediate connection to Warner Media as a company. And I think it makes the most sense. I think Warner Media could still license content, anime content for HBO Max if they were to sell Crunchyroll off. But I just don't think anybody's going to be buying it for one point five billion dollars. Yeah. It's it's the the price tag is, is quite high, but I, I guess my focus is not so much on the price tag. I mean those those numbers they always figure them out, and they they it's not really for for us to decide as how much is a company worth. Um, there are much more <laughs> quite capable people who can who can figure that out. I think that from a strategic point of view, it makes sense. I mean, Crunchyroll, HBO Max is trying to have an international rollout, yes, and Warner Media is you know trying to focus on international growth, but right now they're focused on the U.S. domestic market, and uh, unfortunately. Like there are a lot of people who do like anime, but it's a very niche audience, and it might be for the benefit of AT and T and Warner Media from a resource allocation, you know, point of view that Crunchyroll is, is great at what they do, but for our company, it doesn't fit who we are and who we're trying to target. And you know, anime is just not huge in America. It's just it just isn't. So not as much as it is you know overseas. And so I feel like giving it to a, a to a competitor that can that has the time, that has the bandwidth, that has the main power to really invest in it and to grow the service is the best thing I think for Crunchyroll because I feel like there is there is an opportunity for them to be globally a huge powerhouse um, but it just it doesn't really fit in with each each with um, sorry Warner Media's business plan in their in their future so from that aspect it just it makes sense um, there's some properties that you would sell off and there's some properties that you keep to yourself um, anime just unfortunately in the US market where they're trying to have this big push isn't as big currently and then yes you might compare it to okay well what about DC Universe what about DC Comics what about you know the, the video game division well superheroes are really huge around the world but they're also really huge in america and batman superman wonder woman like those are huge properties um aquaman made over a billion dollars shazam was very profitable if you look at if you take a second a separate way look at disney's playbook of how they bought marvel how they bought lucasfilm how they bought pixar like all those different properties like all those all those ventures create ip for disney and it's all about you know making disney you know bigger and funneling funneling content through the disney plus pipeline to get people involved. And that's what I think D- DC Comics is for Warner Media. Now, from the comic side of me, no, I don't quite like that idea because I think comics should just do their own thing and be separate, but that's not the world we live in. DC Comics and a lot of structuring there, it- it's a funnel of, okay, they're creating IP for you know, Warner Media for HBO Max for, you know, whatever studios that Warner Media has to, to produce and make shows and, and movies and stuff like that. So those are properties that can make DC money in the future. You know, like those are really good R and D processes for the future. And yeah, they might make money might by themselves right now for the future. It's going to make a lot more money than Crunchyroll ever will. So that's why they're not going to sell like DC comics or DC universe. Like um, they might get rid of DC universe, but take the DC universe content and move it to something else. 
But you know, like if they sell DC Comics, it's a really dumb idea because you're basically going to have like a some other studio that's going to buy it up, basically be what Disney is now with like Marvel and Lucasfilm. So that's kind of how I see Crunchyroll. It just, it just doesn't fit in with their business plan. It doesn't fit in with them you know, driving much growth in the future. It's a stable business by itself, and I feel like it's going to be a great addition to another another company. But it's not going to give the multiples of revenue in the future of profit that you know DC Comics will or some other their other properties. And the, the debt thing, I mean, I, I get that AT and T has a lot of debt but not nearly as much debt as some other companies. And right now, in the way of, of, of corporate finance, I mean, we're seeing a lot more companies take on a whole bunch of debt. So um, I feel like the debt argument is kind of like, yeah, they're trying to get rid of debt, but I really hope that they don't focus solely on that. And it's the fact of like, it just doesn't fit in with their business and they're just trying to get, like we said before, like Warner Media all in the same direction of, hey, everything is 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 to get content through HBO Max. The TV shows, movies, any IP is to funnel and you get it through the HBO Max and you kind of like pipeline. And then- honestly makes the most sense because the next bit of news we have is that DC Universe original content has been confirmed to be migrating over to HBO Max. Now, I don't think this was announced specifically Jim Lee, who's the publisher and CCO of DC. He specifically was interviewed about the future of DC Comics after everything that just was announced with all of the restructuring at Warner Media, And he was asked, you know, what's the plan with DC Universe? And he said, as a community and as a comics hub for, for people, it is a place that we, you know, we can see a future. But when it comes to original content, it makes, makes way more sense as a value perspective for a customer to have the content over at HBO Max, which. Might I add, Tony and I have been saying since back in October when HBO Max was first announced that there was it made no sense for DC Universe to continue on creating original content in the format that they were going to be planning on carrying on with HBO Max. Which, of course, this is contradicting a lot of the things that Bob Greenblatt and Kevin Riley were saying at the immediate launch of HBO Max because they were in the mindset that they could somehow make these other services work because they said, no, we have no intention of shutting down DC Universe in the near future. And I don't think that it's shutting down. I don't believe that it's going to be shutting down. I think it's just going to morph into something new. When they got rid of the yearly subscriptions, a lot of those yearly subscriptions would be coming up in September. I think they're going to be moving to a monthly model, specifically just going forward with a monthly model. And the part of the reason is the price could be adjusting based off of the original content not being there, but there will still be comics. There will still be the community. So it's a matter of how much are they going to be charging for that comics aspect of the business without the original content. I think also there's a potential of them offering a discount like they've already done for HBO Max to existing DC Universe subscribers. And that could be said to be that could be the same thing could be said to a lot of the other services that that uh, are under the Warner Media umbrella. So Boomerang, which is very inexpensive, I believe it's only like four dollars a month or three or four dollars a month at this point. That one has been around since 2017. It has been successful enough because we rarely ever hear about it in the sense of that it you know that it's doing badly, but they continue to ha- add content to it on a normal basis. So that service, but if that content was on HBO Max, it's a huge amount of children's content. That service boasts, I think, three thousand episodes of content. It'd be a huge addition of children's content that isn't currently there. And I think the entire idea of HBO Max is this like super curated amount of content. I think they're realizing, at least now they're realizing this, because before it was like, oh, well, we're going to have 10,000 hours of content. Most of it is made up with all the HBO originals that we have and there will be a selection of other content. And I think ultimately, yes, there's always going to be a selection of content. You're not going to have everything there because they've got deals and licensing deals in place that are going to take content other places. But if you can add content to the service, like the Boomerang content that's on that's consistently on Boomerang, you can add the DC Universe content that's consistently on DC Universe, then you kind of swell those, those issues with people out there who are like, Oh, you know, look, there's no DC content on HBO Max because there's nothing here this month. It all left like what was happening at the end of June when a bunch of the movies were, you know, shifting. So I think that this could solve that problem. There's a lot of television, animated television content on DC Universe 
that could easily fill that gap. There's Batman the Animated Series, Batman Beyond, there's Superman the Animated Series. There's a lot of content on there that they could easily, if it was on HBO Max, silence the critics about there's not enough DC content on HBO Max. And the same thing could be said about the children's content by upping the entire amount of children's content that's available with the content that's on Boomerang. Crunchyroll, if it goes elsewhere, they'll still have some anime, but they don't need to have any, you know a ton of content there because that the audience is only a certain amount of people. So much smaller, obviously, than the people who are looking for DC content and who are much more vocal, and that obviously the, the people who are looking for children's content. So obviously, we've, we've talked about this and we've said this from the very beginning, that it was only a matter of time before the content on DC Universe ended up on HBO Max. We can see HBO Max has morphed into something much different than what they were telling people back in October of last year. They were saying they were looking for a gradual, slow international rollout. We've seen in just the last couple months. They're pushing way quicker for the international rollout for HBO Max. We can see that their original plan was not to you know, mess with the other streaming services that are under the same corporate umbrella. We've seen that change in the last couple months. There's a lot of change going on and it seems like a lot of the changes, things that we've talked about since the very beginning of things that would make the most sense. So obviously they brought in somebody who in some ways is is thinking about the future of the service and the future of the company in the same ways that we've been, but also in some ways makes the most sense because as much as I'd like to attribute Tony and I as these brilliant data analysts when it comes to streaming, a lot of this is very, very common sense type conclusions that you can make from this stuff. I, I agree. All right. So then other streaming providers, Fubo TV is seeking a one hundred million dollar IPO. As far as uh, main discussion, we don't have anything specific this time around, but we do have a secondary discussion. And like I said, it is kind of off the wall because you're probably not going to see this reported anywhere else. So there is a news article that popped up uh, a couple days ago where there are four Indiana cities that are suing Netflix, Hulu, and Disney, as well as DirecTV and Dish Network, because they are not paying a 5% franchise fee to the municipalities that are carrying the services. You might be asking yourself, wait, what? So if you're unfamiliar, if you subscribe to cable, there is something that you will see on your cable bill, which is called a local franchise fee or something like that. And it's not specifically because each cable company has individual franchises in each, you know, region or anything like that. They have, you know, monopolies in some sense when it comes to certain regions. But more specifically, most cable companies have a agreement with the local municipalities and they say, we're going to, you know, we would like to have our service available in your town. And they negotiate a franchise fee so that the town basically gets essentially a sales tax on the service that you're that you're receiving from your cable company. The cable company in turn just charges you. They they they're not paying it, they're charging you for it. So it shows up on your bill as a fee every single month that is is a group, you know, is paid directly to your town. So your town makes money. This article specifically talks about how there was a town um, specifically Valparaiso, the in Indiana, they received in 2017 they were receiving $476,000 per year from these franchise fees. Last year, they only received 446. So they lost $30,000 in two years. And they're attributing it to the fact that people are cutting the cord and they're not paying for cable anymore. And then of course, they're losing their franchise fees. So they've decided that they're obviously Valparaiso, the other, the other Towns include uh, Fishers, Indianapolis, and Evansville. Uh, Indianapolis being the biggest city in Indiana, they have decided they're going to go after Netflix, Disney, and Hulu, and DirecTV and Dish Network because they're not paying franchise fees. And their argument is that these the I'm going to specifically focus on the streaming services, but DirecTV and Dish Network just to just to put it out there, they don't have any sort of lines put in the ground that feed into your house. It's a satellite that you installed to your house and the signal comes down. The municipality has nothing to do with it. That's why you can basically get a satellite wherever you go as long as it's the service is offered because nothing has to do with the wires that are in the ground. So that's that's that. There's actually like zero argument when it comes to that because they're not a lot, you know, they shouldn't be paying any money to the municipality because the municipality is not providing them a service. 
cable companies, however, and the internet providers, they are, in fact, they have lines that are in place in common areas within the municipalities that allow them to get service to your house. So it makes perfect sense. However, going after Netflix and Hulu and Disney because people are cutting the cord and no longer subscribing to cable doesn't make a lot of sense because in order to have Netflix, Disney, and Hulu, you have to still have internet you still have to have an internet connection. Now, while it could be through your cell phone provider, that again, there's no lines there. If it's through a normal ISP and the lines are there, they're still getting some sort of fee. So this lawsuit is the most bonkers thing, but I want to put out there that if this actually somehow goes in the favor of these towns, this opens up a can of worms for so many other areas where other municipalities, not just in Indiana, could also then start charging it and then charge a sales tax, essentially a sales tax, onto the companies and the companies could pass this on to us, which is a problem. But it is just mind-boggling that this is actually something that someone legitimately thinks they have a claim for because in the same sense, you could sit there and say any website that you visit, they're also providing a service. And because you're visiting that website, that website should also be charged a fee every single time. So for example, you're listening to the Streaming Wars podcast. Should we be charged a fee because you're listening to the podcast? Because you're listening to it and wherever you're listening, it's the most ridiculous thing. And I just, it was such a strange thing that popped up and I couldn't believe that this was a real thing. So, and of course it had to do with streaming. So I had, I couldn't resist. (laughs) Oh, this article, what a way to end the show. It is ridiculous. Um, So many different issues. Uh, One, because it's not how the internet works. Like we are, we are, that's not, okay. So I I can see, I see the logic in in charging like the cable companies um, from the simple fact of like, yes, they are providing like a hardwired service to like the the different municipalities, the homes. Um, I can see broadband companies being charged. I can see, you know, they, they do have a thing for like direct TV and dish and it's like, okay, well you might have a satellite dish or you might have something else. Like, okay, that makes a little bit more sense. But for, 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 the parts for suing like for for disney plus hulu and netflix like they run on top of the internet like they they offer no physical structure there the internet is open like it just like what are they going to do like turn on a a a firewall like china's and then if they don't pay the carriage fees they're going to block netflix in that in that municipality like that's ridiculous like this, this lawsuit makes zero sense like the people suing don't understand how the internet works man because that's going to open up the lawsuit for many different things you're going to see somebody that's going to jump on it and be like okay well i want to sue facebook because they offer a service there i'm going to sue twitter i'm going to sue just all these other companies man that's just ridiculous they're going to sue apple you know itunes for for distributing podcasts and then you're going to be charged uh stuff till the pie. this is one of the most ridiculous lawsuits i've ever seen it's also a little bit ingenious when you think about it too like i really hope it's not going to work out i hope it gets dismissed but it is a little bit original and i do appreciate those cities making a move like this but man do people don't understand the internet works come on all right so that was our episode hopefully that was a high note we left on because it is just kind of ridiculous but uh there's a number of trailers that have released over the past week check those out in the show notes the show notes are available on our website the streamingwars.io you can follow us on twitter and discord to check out all the articles that we are talking about here on the podcast and some that we don't you can follow us on instagram for all latest announcements related to new podcast releasing you can send us emails at the streaming wars at gmail.com with any questions comments concerns feedback anything you'd like us to talk about in future episodes and of course wherever you're listening to this podcast any feedback that you can leave us is greatly appreciated with all of that being said for tony and myself this has been the streaming wars and we'll see you guys next time thanks for listening to the streaming wars check us out on twitter and instagram also consider supporting us on patreon Links can be found at thestreamingwars.io.